conference. It's not to say the healthcare system isn't waking up to medical mistakes, safety, and prevention. The conference is going all the time. Sadly, their themes are, what can we do better administratively? And the one that just shocked me was the one in Toronto about five years ago. The number one condition that was reported by people, the people presenting information, wash your hands. Now, that doesn't mean wash your hands at home when you're preparing food. This was the nurses, the doctors in the hospital. And I think you'll... Doctors? Yeah, sorry. Much more than nurses. Yeah, they get their hands a little more bloody than the nurses. How about the food? I'm not, picking on the, I'm not picking on the nurses, except the doctors will blame me later for not catching the nurses. But the point is, in the hospitals, the issue was washing hands. In 2000, how can this be the number one issue to remind people to constantly wash their hands? Well, okay, fine. If that's a problem, great. Let's, let's deal with it somehow quickly. The problem I had was that was portrayed to be the only problem in healthcare. Like, it was the burning bush. Wash your hands and life is going to be great. No, I don't think so. It still comes down to did you get the right diagnosis from the right doctor at the right time and the right treatment? And wash your hands as I'm doing it. Uh, this business of accountability, um, I have a young friend whose husband, who was healthy, was suddenly taken to, the, to a hospital in BC and he died within a week. Well, there were, um, there were reasons that she decided to pursue the case. She went for two years, spent an enormous amount of money with a lawyer, yeah. could not get the records that he wanted. It was an impossibility, and he, the lawyer finally said to her, give up, I don't think you're going to win, and you're going to be destitute. We, we recognize that whether it's health care or anything else in our society, the legal system is, is great, but it also has administrative slog or burden attached to it. And in healthcare, it should be a thousand percent transparent as to what happened, why it happened, and put it on the table. Canadian law is set up in such that we can't and don't have those American-style lawsuits where, where uh, Lynn is going to be granted $200 million because of something that happened. In Canada, your costs are really uh, fixed in some circumstances. You might get something for loss of wages and pain and suffering, but the, if you take a look at the damages, that they're awarded. There's laws that kind of cap all that. So who's worried about how much money is going to come out of this? We don't even we don't even tackle blame. There, the adverse event problem is so large that the medical profession published a report that said to err is human. Well, I get that. I mean, we all make mistakes no matter what we do. But you're telling me that the problems in healthcare leading to fatalities, and don't forget. Not everybody who has a, has a problem or an adverse event in healthcare dies. Some end up living with the problem, whether it's two months before they recover or a lifetime. That's a huge cost in healthcare, huge. And the, the things that are done for you and I in the last 24 hours are, are you know, huge life-saving things, unless I got a DNR on my report. But trust me, if I went in with a broken leg, I had no interest in signing a DNR. You're there to fix my leg, so why did I die? So the point is that as tragedy events happen, the hospital utilization becomes huge. The life-saving events comes huge. All the technology comes sweeping into the room, and that's huge, and that's costly. So adverse events, to be sure, are a huge issue in cost, both for the quality of life, unnecessary loss of life. If we're concerned about car crashes, drunk drivers, why are we less concerned about the mistakes that take people's lives when it's just routine health care? We need to become more involved because it is our body, it is our family, it is our friends. You can't just turn to me as a doctor and say, well, Don, you know best. That movie ended a long time ago. Education. We need to broaden the research capacity and integrate providers. Part of our problem in healthcare today, it's as much of a political and business sector as any other facet that you know. Don't think for a moment that life in the health sector is all love and harmony. We have regulated health professions who have actually lobbied and succeeded in blocking the inclusion of services in an integrated primary care model. Those are regulated professions. 
You don't get to do that as a regulated profession. As an association, you get to lobby for yourselves and your colleagues. But as a regulated profession, you don't get to interfere in that level from denying people services. These are things that have to be put on the table, publicly addressed, and fixed. Because it's your health and your dollars that we're talking about. Manpower, this is a choice that we're starting to see. Government has done a good thing. In legislative reform in 2009, the government changed the whole legal framework that helps professions organize and work. <coughs> and the end result is that government has actually said, we want people to have more choices from more practitioners. And that's good for you. We haven't, however, rolled that out in a meaningful way that the public is getting simple information from the health professions and the health authorities so that you are told, if I've got a problem with my left arm, I got these three professions, these six things that can all be done, and guess what? You should be able to find data that if there's three things that can be done for your problem, you should be able to find data that says, if I do number one, it has a 60% success rate. Fair enough. What do I do if I'm in the 40%? Well, here's plan B. So you should have data that says, here's the one that has the highest success rate, the fastest outcome, lowest risk, and economics as well. So th we are slowly moving into this, just not fast enough. Freezer uh, Institute. You didn't mention drugs. It's the, most, it's the fastest increasing cost in healthcare. Well, the, the drugs I'm going to come to in a moment when it comes to the uh, the Council of uh, the Council of the Federation of the Kenyans. And the, the two things that have become the, the, the focus since 2012 on that score is uh, diabetes and diabetic leg ulcers. And uh, again, uh, the drug push is for the governments to find a way to buy more drugs, but larger scale buying for savings. Nobody's looking at, did you need the drug? Nobody's looking at, are there, are there alternatives to drugs? Certainly medications are, have a great role in saving lives and improving conditions. Some of us might not be here today if it wasn't for certain drug discoveries. But the point is, we keep selling these things as the only solution. The government looks at this as the only economic saving they can do. Find a way to buy more drugs in a bigger order. So instead of 10 orders of aspirin, maybe we make one order of aspirin, get 10 million doses, and we only have to pay this much money. We need a national pharmacare program. Good just luck. Just like Australia has and a few other countries. They there, totally here's, here's why you won't get one. Here's why you won't get one. Canada. And this is an important thing to understand why some countries may be better or worse than ours. Canada is the only country where the provinces are 100% responsible for health care. The United States, not so much. It has more federal and state interaction. Australia was mentioned. The national government has a hand in the regulation of health care. Canada is one of the few countries, if not the only country, where 10 provinces and two territories can make up their own buying, their own rules, and everything else. Now, that doesn't stop them from getting together over lunch, all 10 of them in two territories, and coming up with a so-called national plan. But the national plan isn't national unless all the provinces sign on the dotted line that says we're all going to do the same buying yeah. at the same time. And of course, there's the Quebec matter, who never does anything with the word national put into it unless it's national Quebec. But I'm not here to talk about my good <laughs> Anyway, the Fraser Institute does great work. But this is an example where even the Fraser Institute. Oh, oh no. Not the Fraser Institute. Please. Okay, okay. I, I, I <laughs> never had it. No way, Jose. All right. Yeah. The Fraser Institute. It's just the corporation lobby. That's the, all they are. Well, I, I won't comment to that one way or the other. I'm not here to talk about the Fraser Institute, good. other than to acknowledge that they do some good work. But my criticism is. When I mentioned to you earlier that healthcare is always portrayed as a lack of money and the solution is magically more money, well, gosh, there's been a negotiation for fee schedule every year that I've been in practice for 40 years. Surely, if more money was the answer, somewhere in the last 40 years we had the solution. Not so. So here's an example that we're still looking at the problem through a very narrow lens, and that is how much money are we spending? Why would spending more money cause me to believe I'm going to get better care in the first place? I'm going to get better care because Lynn here is a better doctor than Margaret. Sorry, Margaret. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a retired dietitian, so I'm all about food. All right. 
So the solution again, more money equals better care? No, not really. These, these things are covered off in the book, so you know, the, the best compliment we had from the book, and this was from somebody I had no knowledge of whatsoever, they sent us an email and said, I, had, I was so mad after the fifth chapter, I had to stop, put the book down and stop reading for a while. And that made Gary and I feel terrific, because we really didn't know if we had written something that resonated with you, the public. So when we started getting feedback that said, you know, I was so mad by the fifth chapter, I had to put the book down for a while before I could read again. And there's probably a few boring chapters in there, depending on, on your views. Now, the Comox Valley Nursing Center, when I was in uh, at the uh, conference that Rhonda Nixon organized in Toronto, uh, Toronto <laughs> uh, Nanaimo, <laughs> there's a difference. Um, both are the centers of the universe. No, not the um, In any event, Nanaimo, uh, my mother lives in Lansville, so I, I'm very passionate about the whole island. But one of the attendees came up to me after the conference and said, I was so surprised and happy to see reference to the Comox Valley Nursing Center because it is a model where the nurse practitioners and the community are doing more for empowering people and getting more of that person involvement in healthcare choices and planning. Here, watch my camera. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. It is still midnight, and I'll be the only one standing here. <laughs> so we'll just get past the nursing center. Now, one of the things that I think the minister, this is actually the minister, George Abbott. Love him or hate him, that's your choice. However, I really love what is attributable to he and his staff at that time. The greatest untapped resource in healthcare is the consumer. This is what I've been saying from the beginning. Well-informed patients, that's a problem, because we're not really well-informing you, get better care from their doctors, and here's the key, provide better care for themselves. The issue at hand is how to get the right information into the hands of the right person at the right time. We fail miserably at that. We fail miserably to do it as practitioners. The government is struggling because it has no control over what I do as a practitioner. And the other part is we didn't empower you to think critically about healthcare on a daily basis. It becomes boring. You've got other things to do until your checkbook doesn't balance, and then we start telling you you have to spend too much on health care. So this one the ministry got right, and I'd like to continue to show that one and give them credit. Now, we've said that there's a health care crisis. Guess what? There's been a crisis since the 80s. John Jansen, in negotiations, did a task force to investigate health care with the DCMA. We had the Seton Royal Commission. It went on a long time. Great book. Not much implemented. Not because of the commission's fault. The conversation on health that Premier Campbell, then Premier Campbell did, I thought, well, it may have been a joke to some, but I thought it was one of the better efforts, better efforts to get input from the public. Okay? Maybe you didn't like what the end was. There's a real conversation on health. Uh, Fair enough. Separate from their conversation on health. It was a real conversation on health. The, the process is what I'm speaking to. You may not have liked the published outcomes but it was one of the bigger, longest, detailed processes that actually made efforts to find out what we thought. And without trying to engage the public, you're never gonna get a report that fairly represents what the public is trying to tell you, needs, or identifies the problem. The Council of the Federation of Premiers, this is the new one, and they looked at MRIs for back problems as one of their big cost savings, mostly driven by the Canadian Association of Radiologists. I think there's a little self-interest in that. And the other one is uh, diabetes and diabetic leg, leg ulcers. And diabetics have the highest rate of amputation of limbs because of the vascular disease that follows. Well, interestingly enough, arising from leg amputations, we already have a technology in British Columbia that was funded by the Ministry of Health in 87 for research purposes, which identified how to deal with the chronic pain of phantom limb pain. Associated with that, further research at a U.S. hospital demonstrated that not only was it a reduction in pain, it was a reduction in pain because of accelerated wound flow, meaning the wounds healed faster. This continues to be ignored despite the published research and also the clinical findings as well. So we have solutions for some of these things, but they continue to be consistently ignored. And part of that is when you find a solution for a problem and you want to do something new, you got to take a look at what you're replacing and where the money went 
for the old. I don't think you went back far enough in history. Oh, undoubtedly. Go back to the Fuchs report. Oh, yeah, no, no. Uh, there was Kaiser Fuchs. Yeah, Dennis Fuchs. You brought in the emergency system, which you then I had to. I had to draw a line somewhere. And so. all of the resource boards that were created in order to address the real determinants of health, which the South Friends got rid of the minute they got back in. Well, we, had, we ended up with, at one point, the Ministry of Health. Then we ended up with 52 health boards and regions, like. Mm -hmm. Sorry, is a broken leg in Prince George different than a broken leg in Richmond? <laughs> I don't think so. So we went from 52, then we got smarter, we went to 16, and now we have five uh, regional health boards. And so Alberta, in fact, has collapsed. We went from one to a pyramid. Alberta did the same thing, but they quickly realized, well, why? And now they're back down to one. Now, what happens in British Columbia in the future? That's, that's another question. So I mentioned the, the three years thing, I mentioned the health court. The health court is probably the only thing along with the three years federation that is not in the book. So as I say, there isn't anything I would remove from that book, and there's very little that I'd have to add. Questions, please. Please. What are the most, uh, three most important changes <coughs> that you suggest that <coughs> can happen through either the national or the provincial? And I told you about that, whether or not you favor uh, any form <coughs> of um, um, co-payment or anything like that. Okay, so are you asking, is the, is the question in the context of who's paying? Uh, what well, to solve the money problem? Let me give you an example. First of all, Ottawa can't solve the money problem. And the money problem, if it is to be solved, it is each of us taking control over what we're getting, Make sure we're going to the place that's going to fix it. Do the prevention things, as you mentioned. If it's three things you're looking for in terms of the money thing, first of all, I can realize that it's provincial, not federal. You're waste, we're wasting our collective time and breath sending letters to members of parliament in Ottawa. They have no influence in health care. This is important to understand. If you need to make a change, you got to know who to address the change to. It's here. It's BC. You're living in Victoria. The ledge is not far away. And in the recess, all those MLAs are in their constituencies, at least on Fridays and other days. We submitted in 19, when the user fees were starting to creep in, and we had that 10-year rate freeze by the government, they froze MSP rates, they froze ICDC rates, they froze uh, education rates, tuition rates. Well, the only thing they couldn't freeze was escalating costs. They froze how much was being paid. So naturally, eventually, you get a bit of a crisis. All those costs kept rising for 10 years, and one day you had to pay for it. However, what we did, and I mean six health professions, we went to government when user fees were being introduced. And we represented optometry, uh, health problems, chronic problems, spine problems. And we went to the government and said, look, British Columbians are paying $36 per capita per month for Medicare premiums. OK? $36 per month. Healthcare isn't free, we know that. But what, we're, what, what we keep missing is actually how much we're paying and how we're doing that. So in the Medicare premium model, which was $36 then, we all know what it is today. Six professions went to the government. We all had the data, the Ministry of Health participated in the discussions, and we said, if you increase the user fee, if you increase the Medicare premium from $36 to $38, $2 per month per person. It's not an exorbitant sum. And then for those who weren't paying 36, we factored that in, okay? We presented a proposal that showed zero user fees, your coverage for your services, and it was mathematically shown that on an actuarial basis, this could be done by a per capita going from $36 a month to 38. We spent six, seven months talking about it, in the end, the government said, no, we don't want to do it. And partially, they said there was the legislation. Well, fast forward eight years, legislation goes away. Uh, they said, well, we can't afford to increase user fees. What happened when the legislation ended? Right now, you're paying $50 per person? 60 65 So, you know, the, the argument that, all the arguments that were put forward to say, we don't want to do premium funding from 36 to 38 were totally false. Mm -hmm. And they were proven to be economically inappropriate. If I have a prostate problem in Richmond, and a woman has a 
uterine problem in Prince George. Everybody accepts that's all part of Medicare. It doesn't matter if it's a male-specific thing, a female-specific thing, if it's a Prince George thing, if it's a Richmond thing. There are things we accept in society that are all part of that basket of Medicare. So in this case, we know how to fund health care. And the issue in the book, people say, well, what's the point of the book? We have enough money, we're spending it terribly. And if we don't recognize why we're spending it terribly through adverse events, inappropriate treatment, high cost of things, and the drugs, if we refuse to recognize what the cost drivers are, you're just going to end up spending more money indefinitely and experiencing more adverse events. Uh, I'd like to uh, actually recommend a book that neither Don nor I wrote. <laughs> and it's one that came out in the spring by uh, Jeffrey Simpson, who writes yes. in the Globe and Mail, and it's called Chronic Condition. And it's an excellent analysis from a health policy perspective. And he says the same thing that Don says, is it's not the money, because we pay premium prices for mediocre care. You know, and, and excuse me, but he also makes the point that one of our difficulties is we're next to the United States, which has truly awful care. Mm -hmm. So even though we have mediocre care, it looks pretty good compared to them. But <laughs> if you compare us to many of the European countries, we're not very good. No, we're 10th among 17 countries. So, you know, for a country that has allegedly free care. One last question? Uh, um, no, this isn't a question, but it's something quite interesting. My dad had peritonitis years and years and years ago as five, and he always credited Dr. Gershaw with, with his survival. And uh, that was a medicine hat. We were all young kids. Yeah, yeah. Family. Yeah. And um, I said, we were all young kids, and now I'll be 92 next month. So. You're still a young kid. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought you might like to know that. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, there's, there's many great things done, but we got to start realizing there's many more things we can do and should do. So you started your talk mentioning the ownership of your body, and, uh, and you've also talked about preventative measures uh, in terms of savings for health care costs. I wonder if you had any... Uh, what, what your thoughts would be in terms of the quality of the food that you eat. Oh, quality. That, that, yeah, I, I have a real passion on that one. Uh, number one, uh, I think it should be natural, not genetically modified. And I think the body of evidence that is there, and you know, if you're lucky in Vancouver Island, you've got a whole community on, on the east coast of Vancouver Island uh, growing organic foods and whatnot. We're seeing it starting to come in Vancouver. Uh, absolutely. I, long before uh, the, the farm salmon issue got crazy, uh, I was watching a program, and I'm, if, if I'm wrong, it's because the memory cell died. But here's what my live memory cell remembers. A, co a commercial of a couple of people holding, if you go and paint your house, you get this fan of colors, you know those color charts I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. These people were standing in this commercial saying, you know, we, we raise farm salmon for you, and we get to make it a really nice color. And look at the color that we've picked. I'm like, what? <laughs> you're, you're, you're advertising that you're, you're dying or causing the flu? Well, of course, we all know the history that's true. And, and I think that commercial only lasted three weeks where someone said, wait a minute, maybe the public's not going to like the fact that we're <laughs> salmon. The other part that bothered me all the heck was the, the issue of the farm salmon. And, and I've done my share of killing wild coho and wild springs and all the rest of that stuff. So that's, that's my fault. But anyway, the farm salmon thing bothered me from a couple of perspectives. And, and the one was the chemicals that were being necessary to raise these things. Right. Those chemicals, in part, are stored in fat cells in our own body and animals, the fat cells, right? And they used to say, well, our animals don't, our, our wild salmon don't have any more fat cells than the wild ones do. You know what? I'm not even going to bother to count them. I'll give you that. But what you didn't acknowledge was that your fat cells in the farm salmon are bigger. They store more. Why? Because those are growth hormones. So. You know, the food chain is huge and it's critical. And if we're going to have the issues of uh, social determinants of health, quality food is one of them. Quality water, quality of the environment. So, yeah, I think absolutely right. Thank you. Thank you very much.
privilege. We really enjoyed it. And you've certainly given us insight into the import of us being knowledgeable consumers. It's that word consumers. We should not be fearful of asking our doctor for a second opinion. We should not be fearful of asking those questions because there is no such thing as a stupid question. And if you're looking and concerned about your own health, your own body, your loved one's health, be a good, knowledgeable consumer and ask those questions. Thank you. I have a little Thank you. Um, we're going to have a short break right, right now because we do have some refreshments to put out and uh, we have a special uh, celebration kind of today. I know that um, Doreen, you mentioned you're going to have a birthday coming up and we have somebody here who does so much for so many and that's our Allison and I know Allison, you've just had a birthday so best birthday wishes to you from us all. Yay! 